Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gottberg. Once the gap between the train and the platform. Once the gap between the train and the platform. Hello there, Shipping Podcast listeners. Welcome to the 33rd episode of the Shipping Podcast. This time we're going to talk about piracy and hostages. I will be introducing you to Sue Williams, a former police officer at the Scotland Yard. First, I want to introduce you to the International Maritime Bureau, which was established in 1981 to act as a focal point in the fight against all types of maritime fraud, malpractice and piracy. That is IMB for short. And they have a piracy reporting center called PRC. IMB, PRC. So when I say that, it's International Maritime Bureau Piracy Reporting Center. The reporting center was established in 1992. And that is a 24-hour and free service for shipmasters to report any piracy, armed robbery or stowaways incident. It's supposed to act as a single point contact and they report immediately to local law enforcement and to all vessels in the region. And then they continue to report it to IMO, governments and so on. I think that when you're not working in shipping, you don't even think about the danger, the risks of piracy. But for the seagoing personnel, that is something they need to take into account when they are working. They could actually become hostages. So this is what we're going to talk about. It's a heavy subject, but I think it's important. So I looked up the IMB's latest report, which was for the first quarter of 2016, where they highlight the growing violence off the coast of West Africa, where 44 seafarers have been captured so far this year. Worldwide, there has been 37 piracy and armed robbery incidents in the first quarter of 2016. Three vessels have been hijacked and 29 have been boarded. At the moment, there are 28 hostages captured. Just think about that. It's horrendous. But now to the lady of the day. It's Sue Williams. I met her at a conference in 2007 or 8. At that moment, there was so much more piracy going on in the Gulf of Guinea, Somalia and so on. And I was a marine hull underwriter, so I had to know all about where the risks were. I was ensuring the ships going into these war zones, as we call them, in the marine insurance business. Sue stood there at the conference, dressed in uniform, and just spoke about what it's like to be a hostage and what to do and what not to do if you are a CEO of a company where one of your ships has been hijacked. At that time, there were more than 500 people kidnapped. Fortunately, it's not as many anymore, but still, for the individual, I think it's the worst thing that could happen, almost. And it never hits the news. We just know about it. I think that even though it's very much of Hollywood and Tom Hanks, I think you should watch the movie Captain Phillips, which is the Hollywood version of one of the Maersk vessels being boarded some years ago. I actually met the real Captain Phillips when I was in LA a couple of years ago. He was speaking at the conference International Association of Ports and Harbors in Los Angeles. And he was signing books. And he was everything you think an American captain is. And I'm sure that Tom Hanks took some of his acting from the real Captain Phillips. Listen to Sue and think it through. How does your company prepare for crisis? And are you doing it the right way? This is Sue Williams for you. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is uh, Sue Williams. Uh, These days, I work as an independent hostage negotiator 
and, uh, and crisis manager. So how did you end up there? Um, long story, really. As a late teenager, I joined the Metropolitan Police in London. And during my career, at some point, the opportunity arose to become a, a police negotiator. And that was uh, approximately ooh, 26 years ago. And police negotiators primarily get involved in talking people out of committing suicide, talking people down from cranes. They also manage incidents where people have been kidnapped or where they have barricaded themselves into a building. So you, you get involved in a lot of diverse means of negotiation, but the primary one is um, hoping to try and make somebody realise that, that life is worth living and to talk them out of doing what they intend to do at that moment, which is to kill themselves. So that's where I got all my um, my grounding, my background, my understanding that communication with a lot of hard work can earn you the right to negotiation. Um, so from there, I progressed within the subject. Some people say I talk a lot, so... Perhaps that's why, but I progressed and I eventually became head of the hostage crisis negotiation unit at Scotland Yard, which was a role that I held for nearly seven years. During that time, myself and my team were responsible for um, returning British subjects, and they were very keen in those days that it was just British subjects, British subjects who were kidnapped overseas. So it was a busy time because, uh, fortunately, a few British citizens were kidnapped in places like Nigeria, Iraq, Afghanistan. So it was a, a busy time. And um, as my, my retirement approached, I had to give some thought to, um, to what I would do because I had a wonderful job, maximum job satisfaction. I tell you, there's no greater feeling than actually bringing back a family member who has been kidnapped to a family who honestly believe they're never going to see them again. It, it is the biggest um, biggest high in the world, really. So what was I going to do? At around about the time of my, my retirement, I um, was involved in the um, response to a, a kidnap of a um, humanitarian aid worker. And during that time, a bit of a light bulb moment, I decided that I would um, carry on doing the work that I... Um, I had been doing at Scotland Yard, but as an independent um, person, an independent consultant, if you like, uh, a lot of people said it wasn't possible and sort of gave me six months, as it were. But uh, here I am seven years later and um, still contributing. And now the great thing is that I'm able to help every nationality and, and not limited to one. With regards to piracy, Many years ago, I think it was 1992, I was involved um, in trying to find out who killed a British sea captain. His name was Captain James Bashforth. I was um, tasked by the British Foreign Office to um, to find out how he died on the on the boat MV Baltimore Zephyr. Yeah, that was the name of the boat, Baltimore Zephyr. How he died, and it was interesting because I had never done an investigation on water before. I was a land detective, certainly not a sea detective. And during that investigation, I um, learnt about pirates. And from 1992 to this present day, I'm still learning about pirates. So that was the first case, because sadly, Captain Bashforth was actually murdered by pirates as they boarded his ship. And that was the beginning of my involvement with piracy. So given my um, background of negotiation and my involvement and, and previous knowledge of piracy, the two sort of came together um, around about 2006, 2007, because um, more vessels were being taken and negotiations were needed. It's a very long roundabout way of saying how yeah, but we're here today. It's great. It's great. What is a QPM? You have got a QPM. Yes, I have, yeah. Um, it's, um, I'm very, very fortunate and honoured to have it. Um, I think it was awarded to me in um, 2003. It's a medal that um, is given out by the Queen, Elizabeth, and it is awarded to very few in comparison when you think how many 
how many thousands of police officers there are in the United Kingdom, it's awarded to a tiny, tiny percentage of officers who are seen to um, have displayed some some high merit. And so I was given it for my services to hostage negotiation and saving life. So, uh, yeah, I was very pleased. It's a nice surprise. I didn't know it was coming. So how was that? Did you have to go to Buckingham yep. Palace? Or? Yeah, my family and I all went to Buckingham Palace, big ceremony. The Queen um, made some very polite and nice chit-chat. She has this ability of looking at you as if she knows exactly who you are and why you're there, which is quite a knack, really. And um, she pins the medal on you, and then you all go off and have a nice tea. Oh, I see. <laughs> very British. Very British. You told me how you got involved with the shipping industry, but when did we meet? We met... Um, Not far from this building. No, and it was like 2010? Maybe 10? No. No? Seven or eight. Was it really? Yes, it would have been eight, I think, before the Worcester Conference. Yeah, yes. 2008. Yes. Because I left 2009. Right, yes, it would have been 2008. And then you were delivering a speech about piracy and uh, what to, what to do and what not to do, more or less. Yeah, I think I, I may, I can't remember exactly, Lena, but I think I would have been talking about preparation because for me that, that really is a big issue. I sit down with companies who sometimes, perhaps not so much in the maritime, but, but other companies who haven't thought about the possibility that somebody may be taken against their will. They have sent that person to a dangerous area, but they haven't actually thought it through. It's this, it will never happen to us attitude. So consequently, I really do like to go on a bit about preparing for such an incident. And that is where I also like to work with HR departments in that preparation. Sometimes there's a bit of a crossover because the security department think HR are looking into the preparation and HR seem to think security are. And actually, nobody is. But I think there's a bit of a clue when it comes to kidnap. Kidnap's about people, and HR is about people. So I would, I like to see, and I try to encourage more involvement of HR in the preparation uh, of something, just in case something goes wrong, so that we are not starting from a catch-up perspective. We're actually starting from a level, a level playing field, and we can respond. We can do all the golden hour, as they're called. We're not actually playing catch catch up. So it's a form of awareness that you're trying to... Preparation, I think. Yeah, making sure that the security people are aware of what they've got to do, what their immediate actions are, who they've got to inform. Making sure that HR have all the details of family. And this is really important nowadays. When I first became a hostage negotiator, social media wasn't around. 24-7 news wasn't really around. But both these dynamics have impacted hugely on the response to any form of kidnap, really, whether on land or sea. And so nowadays, it's really important to try and contact family members, maybe a false alarm, but that happens sometimes. But because of social media and because of the 24-7 news, it's not great if we have our family members finding out from CNN or from somebody's Facebook account. So that's why it's really important to to be prepared to make sure that you have access. Four o'clock on a Sunday morning is probably the worst case scenario. Can you action everything that needs to be done? Can you inform the people who need to be informed at four o'clock on a Sunday morning? Mm. That's the stress test. Well, if you like, yeah. It's about being professional, I think. So... um, and, and it gives you peace of mind. It gives many people peace of mind that they know things are in place. Oops. Mm. If we stay in shipping, where are the most dangerous places nowadays? Hotspots change. Um, and we can only deal with the reported statistics that we have. So I uh, hear sometimes that many incidents are not reported. So, so we don't know what we don't know. We don't know, but th- they change. Um, as you know, the Gulf of Aden at one time was the Gulf of Guinea and now um, off the coast of, uh, of West Africa. So the, the hotspots change with, with trends. And what about the Strait of Malacca? These days, um, I think it's still a risk, but I don't know it would feature in one of the hotspots. Uh, 
Sorry, I don't have the statistics to hand. No, I'm I'll, sure I'll, somebody has. I'll put that in. So what happens then when there is a piracy attack? It's one of the, the most dangerous parts, actually. When anybody is taken kidnap on land or sea, very few people die. When you, you look at the statistics, it's sort of 4 5 6% of people who sadly don't make it through any sort of kidnap or hijacking, which in the scope of things, I suppose, is, is a low statistic, but it's still a very sad and one that I would like to see reduced even further. But the two occasions, which are the most high risk for people who've now found themselves hostages, is actually at the time of the abduction, so at the time of the taking. And that's because everybody is uncertain. Everybody's on a high alert. It's, um, it's a bit of a, a teeter totter. Everybody's emotions are really high. You weren't expecting this. You're stressed. You're anxious. So that is a really stressful and volatile time for both the good guys and the bad guys. And that's the time, sadly, when people can get injured or, worst case, killed. So consequently, that's a time where it's the high risk for everybody. The other occasion when it's a high risk is at the rescue attempt because you and I come from countries where our special forces are trained and very professional and know exactly what they're doing. There's still a risk even when our officers go in to, to do the hostage rescue. But in some parts of the world, they're not quite so proficient at doing the hostage rescue. And so that can be quite dangerous. Also, um, hostages sometimes are so pleased that they see the, the, the cavalry coming in, they see the rescue, and they automatically assume that the, the soldiers effecting the rescue know that they are the good people and not the bad people. And actually they don't. So everybody would have to be treated in the same way because in the, in the stress and the high, highly volatile situation, nobody knows who's the good guys or who's the bad guys. And so that's why sometimes people jump up to um, identify themselves as one of the hostages and that's actually the worst thing you can do if you're... Um, in a rescue attempt, you, you have to lay low and obey all the instructions that the, the soldiers shout at you. I can see why people do that. Yeah, they're very keen to get out of there. Yeah, and um, to see the, the end of that terrible situation they have been in. Mm. So where do you come into this? When are you alerted? Two possibilities, three possibilities actually. Um, sometimes I'm advising on the negotiations with uh, the kidnappers. Sometimes I am advising the chief executive or the crisis management team on the strategy, the long-term strategy and the immediate action that needs to be taken. And sometimes I am supporting the families of the crew or the hostages into, um, can't say exactly what they can expect because although I've been involved in hundreds of cases of kidnaps, everyone is different. I, I can never tell you that this is definitely going to happen, but working with the families and trying to prepare them for for what might happen, but also helping them through what is a very difficult time and, and, and requires ordinary people to suddenly find extraordinary strengths from nowhere. It's particularly important to, to make sure that families don't do the wrong thing, which can actually make matters worse. There are some people who will exploit a sad situation and try and get money, extort money out of families. So it's a hand-holding exercise with families and it's um, advice at, at all the different dynamics during a kidnap. So if we talk about, uh, yeah, you said there were three different times you could get involved in that. If we, if we start with the CEO, how do they react to their staff being kidnapped? Yeah, that really does depend actually on the size of the company because in some of the smaller companies that I work with, their staff are their personal friends. The bigger ones are not quite so likely, but in the smaller ones. And that's one of the, um, can be a bit of a challenge because the person, and, and I don't say for one minute that the CEO should chair the CMT, the crisis, sorry, the crisis management team, because the rest of the business has to carry on and the chief exec sometimes has to step back and let the crisis management team, the emergency response team, the, in America they like to call it the situation response, different names for the same function, a team of men and women who manage a crisis or an incident. So the CEO 
sometimes is stepping back from that so that he or she can carry on managing the company and can be there for the big decisions, can be the strategic decision maker, but is not there every day. But also the person who does chair the team, whatever their position in the company, they should not be emotionally involved. And that's very difficult to do because when you hear, as you can now, Technology allows us to hear some horrible screams and begs and pleas on video or on, on audio. The person who is in charge of the team has to be quite emotionally detached from that. And that's harder to do if you know the people. So um, for that reason, we have to make sure that this table, that the table that's going to manage the crisis, can as best as possible leave the emotion outside. It's not easy to do. But you, it has to be an informed team, up-to-date information, has to make decisions based on up-to-date, evaluated information. So if emotion gets in the way, that really does hinder the progress and any progress from the, the crisis team hinders the progress in the field or at the crisis site. The one thing that we're not in control of so much during a kidnap, everything is going on that we are not in control of. The one thing that we are in control of is our own emotions, and that's what we have to be. And that's why a plan, a practiced plan, is a really good idea, because in those first few hours, you need something to hang on to. And I know some people say that a plan can be the first casualty of war, at least in the early hours, the beginning hours, yeah, the early hours of the incident. It is something to to hold on to, and uh, I'm a great believer in minimalistic plans. We don't want to be reading great tombs of what to do and not what to do during a moment of stress or crisis. We like a few flow charts, do this, do that, a few people to call. Um, and most, I think the last year or so, most of the um, initial team gatherings that I've been involved in have all been virtual. So that, again, is a sign of the times that we're not all rushing to come to a, a big boardroom, sit around a big table. We're, we're now doing it virtually which, of course, technology allows us to do. That's great because that cuts down on, on the travelling and it makes life easier. But the downside of that is you come together as a team with a, a little bit less information than you would have in the past because as you travelled to to the meeting, information was usually being gleaned all the time. But now you, you come a lot earlier, which is good, but you do have less facts. Advice on how the negotiations are going, what's the true meaning behind the negotiations, what's the main objective. Do the kidnappers really want money? Are they pretending that there's some environmental issue? Are they pretending that there is another reason? What's the true meaning of their motivation? So advice on the negotiations, how it's going. Do we know how the welfare of the hostages are? We have to occasionally make sure that their welfare is is good, so we, we manage that through various means. So it's just keeping an eye on the negotiations to make sure they're still going on, to make sure they're going in the right direction, to make sure we are still talking to people who have the knowledge and influence around the hostages. Because nowadays, and this is very common now, because of social media and because there is so much in the news, people can pretend that they are the hostage takers and they can make demands, requests, for reasonably small amounts of money in the scope of things. And we have to make sure that we're not talking to those people. We have to make sure that we are talking to the real kidnappers and not these people who, through um, interrogating the internet, find out as much as they possibly can of the people concerned and just heap a whole pile of misery on families and the crisis management team. Because, of course, the fake kidnapper is very distracting takes up a lot of time and it's just a waste of time and it's really it's, a, it's horrible when it when when you've found out you've wasted time so that's why we have to eliminate these people quite early on and make sure that we are talking to the true people that have influence and can affect the freedom and the release of the hostages how terrible there it is it's a new feature that it is something new well they've been around a little while but life's a lot easier for them now because so much is out there on um, on the internet I get upset just thinking about it. I get upset for piracy and, and really kidnapping people. But then again, someone trying to earn some money on that is terrible. Mm. Yeah. So what are the different phases of an attack or a, or a 
were kidnapped? Um, well, first of all, you have the initial abduction, attack or hijacking. Sometimes that's pre-planned. Sometimes that's wrong place, wrong time. Sometimes individuals are targeted because of their nationality, because of their wealth, because of their religious commitments, or sometimes because of the religion that they practice. So the abduction happens. Sometimes it's in public. When it's in public, marketplace, for instance, then we have to react pretty quickly. Sometimes it's done more covertly, and it takes a little while to realise that the person is missing. Then there's that phase that you go through. Are they missing? Have they been in an accident? Uh, You have to go in the fact-finding mode. What has happened to them? Has somebody got them? Then, when somebody has got them, you have to try and find out who. And it's quite important to to try and find out who has them in the beginning, in the early hours. And the reason for that is organised crime or terrorism will pay for hostages, particularly if they have a, um, a Western passport, which is quite favourable, like mine, and, and a, uh, an American passport. They will pay for hostages, so they will be bought up the food chain. Horrible expression, that I know. So that's why you have to really act quickly, because we want to get our people back before they enter the realms of organised crime or terrorism. So after the, uh, the abduction, there's a period of fact-finding or waiting, one of the two, we will possibly get some demands in. We have to make sure that they are the right people. Are we talking to the people who really do have our people? That takes a little bit of expertise. And then they will come in with what they want. What's their motivation? What do they want? Have they given us any deadlines? Deadlines, to be honest, um, I think most negotiators don't get too phased about deadlines but other people do, and families do, and, and CEOs do. Mostly we know how to handle deadlines. But So we find out who, who we've got, what we're dealing with, and what they want. And then we, uh, we begin talking. We, we don't begin negotiation straight away. We begin communication. Then we have to look at what tools we can use. What other tools have we got in the box? What influence can we bring to bear? Outside influence. What third parties? And third parties are often a a key to the successful outcome of a kidnap. What can we bring to bear for them? And then we have to look at the stakeholders. Stakeholder management is very, very important. And in a shipping case, one of the different factors from a kidnap on land as opposed to a kidnap on sea is you have a lot more stakeholders. When you look at the vessel, the cargo, the crewing agencies, so many more the different nationalities on board. So you have so many more stakeholders with a piracy case and you really have to manage those stakeholders and you have to make sure that everybody is on message and on message means that the safety and the lives of the seafarers is their number one priority. That's what you really have to hammer home to all of the stakeholders and sometimes that's not easy. Sometimes the cargo is more worth than the ship. Yeah, sometimes. That's sad. Well... Yeah. The ship, it's, it's the, yeah. the people. The people must be the main priority. You have to remind everybody in that stakeholder management that we're talking about people's lives here. A ship, I know a ship is very important. wouldn't want to devalue the, the love that people have for ships, but it's a ship. People are people. And then you've got the flag. Then you've got the jurisdiction. Oh, and jurisdiction, the, the flag, yeah, all sorts. Where in the world have you been involved in most? Is that Gulf of Aden or is it... Gulf of Aden and um, and uh, West Africa. Well, not to say that everyone is the same, but there are different um, approaches from kidnappers. I mean, the east and west coast of Africa. Yes, yes, there are actually. Um, some of the differences that I've noticed is the ones on the west coast of Africa. The hijacking seems to be shorter in time duration. The the crew. And this sounds weird to say that are not respected because which pirate would respect a crew? But in my experience on the um, the east side, the crew, not in every case because there have been some horrible cases, but in, in the majority the crew are treated okay. I won't say well, but they're treated okay. But on the west side, sometimes the crew are not treated um, well at all. In fact, there's, there's some evidence of torture even perverse things happening to them. So I think that's one of the differences is the time, the duration, 
a lot closer to the shore on the west coast than on the east. And I believe a larger amount of under-reporting. We don't really know all the figures, I believe, is under-reporting on the west. So, yes, you're quite right, there are differences. I think the business model on the east side, if you can call it that, particularly not in a few years ago, the business model that the pirates had on the east side was well organised. I don't think I see that um, that organisation so much on the west side. Could you explain a little bit about the, the developed business model on, on the east coast? What do you mean by that? It seemed to me that on the east coast, the pirate gang knew what they were responsible for. Quartermasters we even had, people who were responsible for the firearms, keeping the vessels. So everybody seemed to know their job, whereas I don't think on the, the west side they're that, that, that disciplined. I don't think they're that disciplined, uh, and they don't seem to have that structure, which is on the east side. The countries are different, and the, the politics are different. And Do you think that... Uh The EU now for had had any good influence. Oh, on huge them. impact, yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, it's really important that they do stay in there. I don't know what the long term plan is, but no, they have had a really big impact in bringing the statistics down. Because if you look at the numbers of people who have been held in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, we were over a thousand at one stage, weren't we? And that's that's horrendous, and I still can't believe actually how the media didn't really cover. The, the sheer numbers of seafarers who were being held against their will somewhere in the world didn't seem to hit the media in those days, did it? It doesn't hit the media much now, actually. No, and if it would have been a, an airline. An airline. Yeah. 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 And some of them were for years. Some some of those seafarers were held for years, four or five years, I think, in some yeah. cases. Yeah. You know. Terrible. Yeah, and then um, you're in the middle of this uh, attack. What happens then? Well, on some occasions, they will ask the crew to leave the vessel. And that is sometimes, from a logistic and a rescue point of view, a lot harder. So I think that's happening a little bit more now, that they split the crew, leave enough crew to keep the the ship maintained, as it were, and then they take some of the crew on land and take them to a a secret hideaway somewhere. But on not all occasions. On, On some occasions, the crew stay where they are, and there the pirates are on board to to mind them. If we come to the point that there is a, a ransom agreed sometime later, so how is that done then? How do the ransom sum get Well, delivered? that's not as easy as it sounds because there's all sorts of um, legal obligations that all the stakeholders have to adhere to because we have to work within the law, obviously. So we have to do our due diligence because there's much legislation that says you can't just hand money over to terrorists. and You really can't do that. So you have to do the due diligence around all, all that. As for the logistics, that's not a the logistics of the delivery. That's that's not something that um, that that I get involved in. But my my heart sort of is in my mouth sometimes when I have um, read some of the plans of large amounts of money being dropped from the skies in yellow pods and people on camels. But um, yeah, the logistics is something which has to be planned meticulously. There can be no surprises. Or anything can go wrong because, again, the, the the handover is a very crucial time, and so it has to be meticulously planned, every contingency catered for. Is it a difference between having someone on a ship that is being taken than on a land? What are the more than what you've had before? There's logistics. Mm. There's the potential for an environmental issue. There's also um, more chances of having multinational multinationals taken, which means you're dealing with a selection of different governments. It's hard enough getting on with one government. We're getting on with six or seven governments and trying to get them agree on something is quite difficult. I also think the amount of stakeholders, as I mentioned, you don't have as many stakeholders. And you know where, the, sometimes, not always, you know where the hostages are being held on the vessel. So sometimes that's a little bit easier to manage. But the main difference for me between the land and the sea is the amount of stakeholders, just making sure that nobody within that group says something, sometimes well-intentioned, but but says or does something which can endanger 
the hostages. And what about media? If we are leaving social media out for a while, media. Uh, I mean, what is your view on that? There was a, a big uh, Danish case a couple of years ago mm. when where the a newspaper decided just to to tell everything. Yeah. Not so many years ago, it would be possible to respond to a kidnap completely under the wire and nobody knew about it. The advantage to that happening was you don't attract any of these jokers of the fake kidnappers. You take the pressure off of the government or the company who are responding to the the kidnap. You don't open it quite up so much to organise crime because nobody's aware of it. You can protect the family because families get an awful lot of pressure from the media. So if you are doing the response quietly and under the wire, all these things, which are very time-consuming, do not get in the way. And you can usually get somebody back quite quickly if nobody knows about it. That doesn't happen these days. Mr Twitter, Mr Facebook and all the other ones, 24-7 news, usually puts the story out there quite quickly. So that means that whoever is responding to the kidnap, whether it be a government or a company, they're under a lot more media scrutiny, they're asked a lot more questions, the story and the profile of the hostages, and and this is one of the sad effects of of that approach. We like to keep a hostage profile quite low. If they've got any skeletons in the cupboard, let's hope they stay in the cupboard, but they don't when it hits the media. And so you can raise the profile of the hostage, you don't want to do that, because that could either put you into a political realm or it could raise the price, so you definitely don't want to do that. It also puts the family under intense media. Sometimes families have to be rehoused because the media attention is so high. But of course, it also alerts the fact to other kidnappers who think that they could do a better job of this. And then it alerts them to the fake kidnappers as well, which, as I've explained, is the time distraction. So it's what we have to deal with. It's modern times. It's here now. It's never going to go back to what it was. So we we have to deal with it. So our communication plan, our media plan, if you like, has to incorporate social media and has to incorporate conventional media. I understand. And then once the people are recovered or rescued, what happens then? In an ideal world, they will be treated gently. They are very vulnerable people. They will receive a physical checkup. They will receive a psychological debrief. They will be given a little breathing space to recuperate and then hopefully somebody will do a return to work strategy and um, and hopefully their life will go on. That's the ideal outcome. Sometimes within the shipping, because we are dealing with larger numbers, that format doesn't always happen, but they should should definitely be receiving some sort of debrief without a doubt. Uh, and the experts do that. That's out of my hands. The experts who, who manage these hostage debriefs are very good at that. But it, it does need to be done. And language can never be a reason for not doing it. Even though you might have to do it through a, an interpreter, it's not ideal, but it's it's better than nothing. But do you see people afterwards, 10 years later or something like that? Do you meet them? Occasionally at conferences when a hostage talks about their experience, I bump into them in the corridor. But in general, I make it a point not to... Um, Like I said, not to get involved. Mm. Just take the emotion out of it. Mm. And that's that's what I have to do. Because sometimes these don't end well. Sometimes people die. Yeah. So um, that's why you have to detach yourself from the good emotion of a success, but also the sad emotion of when it didn't turn out well. Mm. So how do you see the future for this? Do you see any developments? I mean, you've just told me about the communications are changing and... Uh... Places where people are taken are changing? Technology, I guess, and I'm definitely no technology expert, but I think technology may change some things. Uh, World events, here we are, um, where we are at the moment. So world events, that will have an an impact on where we go from there. We look at Yemen at the moment. um, That's an interesting area to watch from a kidnap perspective. So uh, I think technology and and world events will um, will be the... um, The game changes there, Lena. Mm. Do you know any more female uh, people involved in this? Uh, or are you always the only female? Within um, the military and the police, there are other female, many good ones, very good ones. Um, 
in the, the private sector or as an independent person like myself, they may be out there, I don't know, but I haven't met them. So uh, I don't think there are, but I honestly couldn't be 100% sure. I'm so impressed. <laughs> I can't have that, can I? <laughs> I can leave that in. It's okay with me. <laughs> okay, uh, the shipping industry is often looked upon as the invisible industry. No one knows about us. Yeah, the Cinderella industry, I've heard it called. The Cinderella, Cinderella industry. industry. Yeah. That's a good expression. Yeah. How do you think we could become more visible? I don't know. We all rely on, on the shipping industry. I live on a relatively small island that does rely on it, but... I don't know why it does have that um, that image. Perhaps it's not viewed as sexy enough. Airlines are, aren't they? Yeah, but I think it is a sexy industry. It's a cool mm. industry, and there's so many things happening right oh, now. Oh, it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a vibrant industry. I love it. But um, I, I think your average man or woman in the street doesn't really think about how this bit of fruit travelled from an exotic part of the world to be in a pretty rainy London market. No. I don't think they think about it. So how could we change that? How could we? I just do hostage negotiation, <laughs> not marketing. <laughs> no, that's that's probably why you're so good at it. I don't know. Did you ever have a role model? No, no, I, no. I wish I had. Not really. No, I didn't. Do you consider yourself as a role model now? I get lots of um, yeah. I get lots of requests for for support for uh, younger people. Yes, I do. Yeah, and I try to give the time up where I can. But I think some people think it's a bit of a quick fix and it's something that I can impart in in an afternoon, you know, so for training purposes and stuff. So, um, yeah, I do uh, consider myself as a role model and something that I take uh, quite responsibly. It's hard when you haven't had it. I didn't have any role model either. So it's hard to be a role model because you don't really know how to behave as a role model more than being yourself and being out there and standing up for yourself. Yeah, and and also I had been a, a public servant for 32 years. So it was quite difficult stepping out into the world of business. I could do my job. My job was easy. But managing the business side of that, that was something that was completely new to me and something which I was and perhaps still am not as experienced as, as I should be. And then we got some friends we could maybe drag along with us and help us out on that, because we know a lot of business women, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so who do you think I should interview the next time? Who would you be interested in listening to? On the shipping side, mm -hmm. the youngest female crew member you could find. Starting from the bottom or, or, the or Master bottom. Mariner? Or, no? Yeah, the very bottom. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. How daunting it must be to go into... It's daunting to go into a male environment, but to go into a closed male environment, that, that for me would be interesting. Yeah, look who's talking. You've been into the... Yeah, but it's not closed as much as... Police you know, force. Can, Isn't that a, a bit... It was when I joined. It's not. Thankfully, it's not quite so much now. It did used to be a huge percentage of, of male officers, all of them tall in those days. Oh, was that a requirement? Was in those days, yes. Not for the females? Yes, no, I had to be tall as well. <laughs> <laughs> How tall were you then? <laughs> a bit taller than I am now. <laughs> what do you think a ship owner should think about when he or she thinks that there is a possible piracy attack? The first thing I would consider is location, because location means jurisdiction. So we need to know what we're dealing with. So the gathering of the facts as best as they can be, the confirmation of the facts as best they, they are known at that time. And there's a lot of rumour, so you have to sift out the rumour from, from the real facts. Then I would ask them to, to look at their plan, which hopefully they have, to quickly map out all the stakeholders so we know who the stakeholders are to bring in their media people. So we I'm not saying we go out to the media for one minute, but what they would need to do is have the if-asked holding statements. And that's what we want, the if-asked holding statements. And during those statements, we don't want to give out any nationalities. We don't want to give out any information that can encourage these fake kidnappers. So I would be looking at the plans, the contact, the people, the media issues, 
identifying um, where the families are, what nationalities that we're dealing with, and who are the decision makers. And again, and insur- if insurance companies are involved, response companies involved, just ascertaining who the decision makers are, who the stakeholders are, what are we dealing with, is it a political, is it a criminal, where's the location, which means where's the, the jurisdiction, and what makes us immediately vulnerable. Have we got injured crew? Are we in a war zone? So what are the immediate vulnerabilities that have to be addressed straight away? Do they do that? No, it's not usually a bit of a slower process than that because sometimes people are in denial. They don't want to think that their ship has been taken, so it doesn't always happen as as quickly. Sometimes, not always. Some people get off to a fast start, but sometimes not always too fast. So where do they report that they have an attack? Well, it depends on the location. Location from a, an agency point of view, there are various agencies that, that are reported, but that that really isn't one of the priorities. It has to be done. I know it has to be done, and it would be on the list of things to get round to. But really, you need to get the message back to the decision makers so they can start getting their team together and manage this, because we need to show the other side that we're taking it seriously. We need to show the other side that we will manage it, and that gently that we're in charge. So it's a foreign officer and uh, things like that? Not always with shipping. Yes, they're on the list and they have to be told. But but what I'm saying is that these golden actions, these golden hours, the decision makers have to be told first. Mm. Yeah, but you mentioned that you don't know if all uh, attacks are reported. So there is a piracy. Oh, the uh, IMB, Piracy Centre, International Maritime Bureau, Piracy Centre in Kuala Lumpur. Yes. Do they Maybe. don't get all the reports? Or? Well, we don't know, do we? What would be the reason not to report a piracy attack? Sometimes it's the ego of the captain. Oh, I see. Sometimes it's the fact that there may be corruption issues and they don't wish to detain the vessel for as long as it would take to um, to investigate. There's a few reasons for not reporting. Yeah, there's so many things I don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, <laughs> and me. Lots of things I don't know anything about. I think it's for the best, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's no, my pleasure. Thank you, Lena. This episode is sponsored by the Swedish Club, which is an insurance company, insuring both vessels and crew on board ships. So they need to know and stay updated on piracy and war risk, and their members can find that out through their alert messages. The Swedish Club have actually put up a landing page for this podcast called Voices from the Industry. And they will share the knowledge of Sue Williams with their members. Maybe you have thought about why is Sue standing with her back against the camera? Well, she doesn't want to show her face. And after having listened to her, I think you understand why. I get comments from people that I meet that they think it's so interesting that I have been able to find different kinds of occupations within our industry. I am amazed myself, but so far I have only met 33 people. I have a few more coming up. But if you have suggestions, don't hesitate. Let me know. I have got some new ideas and people have sent me some emails suggesting people to interview. You can do that yourself if you want. Use the email address of hello at shippingpodcast.com and I will try to find a way to go and see them. Next time there will be another interesting guest, I promise you. It's a guest that has appeared on a lot of people's wishing lists. I do save I do save all the suggestions from people who has been interviewed on the shipping podcast and try to reach out to the people who most people want to listen to. The next time, it's one of them. So from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to the shipping podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast where the maritime professionals are talking about their everyday jobs.